the sun didn't come, the one in China. No, it's too, it's too on, difficult. To yeah, we met him on the plane the last time coming down. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And Kobe was right. coming to see him. Right. Anyway, take it easy. Thank you so much. Thank you so
So we start in at one. Yes, I know. I know. Completely in your hands. <laughs> find out something because it's school time.
Pleasant good afternoon to all. Can I ask persons to please have their seats? A warm welcome to each and every one of you who have come to celebrate the life of our dear, dear brother, Keith Clark. The passing of Brother Keith has left a void in our hearts. The many of us who were privileged to know him will remember his commitment to God and the church, family, friends, co-workers. His demeanor, his goodness, his generosity to persons he came in contact with. He resolved many issues that confronted him in the workplace, Rotary, or when he was playing dominoes with the boys down by Washi shop. He provided us with happy memories that we will cherish for a very long time. He embraced life with a gusto and is now at peace with his Lord. Most importantly, we are comforted in also knowing that he is united with his beloved wife, Lola, and recently departed sister Yvonne and all other family members. As we listen to the tributes and eulogy, we will hear more about this remarkable person, Keith Clark. We start the tributes with a tribute from the grandchildren and relatives in England, and I will read out the poems. This first one is from the grand grandchildren, Emil and Eli. One day, the angels came and took granddad far away. But in the stillness of the night, I could almost hear him say, Dear grandchild, I will miss you. You mean so much to me. But Jesus called me to his side. In heaven I will be. A place of God's greatly be great beauty. No chairs or earthly cares. Only peace, peace and joy forever and love beyond compare. So remember all the good times. Don't think about the sad. Treasure all the special moments and all the years we actually had. And if you trust in Jesus, I can promise this and more. You will get a hug from Grandad someday on heaven's golden shore. Granddad Keith, you can now be with Grandma Lola and Granddad Harry. Thank you for all the great qualities that you instilled in all of us. A true mentor in our lives. We will love you always. And as I said, this poem is from grandchildren Emil and Eli. We have another short tribute. Forever in our hearts, we remember your fondness, Keith's warmth, his loving spirit on our visit to Grenada, and of course, our master of ceremonies, helping make our wedding day so special almost 15 years ago. Our thoughts are with his family on this day. Rest in peace, Keith. It was an honor to know you. And this is from Pauline. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From henceforth, now said the Spirit, 
they may rest from their labors, for their good works follow them. Brother Keith did lots of good works. We will now have a tribute which would be done by the president of the Rosary East Club, President Mr. Charles Hussle. Good afternoon. Remembering Rotarian Keith Clark. There are so many facets to the memoirs of this small giant, our dear friend and brother, Rotarian Keith Clark, that to adequately express his rich legacy will require much more than two minutes. So, as a club, we would like to share with you the special and unique experiences we had with Keith and the integral role he played in our club. When you remember Rotarian Keith, you will remember a mischievous smile and a kind of youthful exuberance that was infectious. From his crisp English suits and fancy shoes to his sophisticated accent, you just had to love and respect the man. But beyond this charm was a serious, industrious, committed man to family, church, and community. Rotarian Keith, in our view, was a successful person who mastered the art of comfortably balancing life. He was always punctual, never loud, never angry, and applied reason and fairness in all his dealing with our club, and as far as we know, to all those he interacted with. He served in many offices of club governance, and in particular as president on at least three occasions. His consistency to serve motivated all of us and he gained our respect and admiration. He was a true leader. He never refused a duty or task. He took delight in reporting on the club's yearly achievements and was the head of the pack at district conference and international conventions. But perhaps one of the most intriguing part of our dear brother's life was his ability to adapt to a changing world of technology and mechanics. Oh, he impressed all of us with his gadgets and creative innovations, from his homemade surveillance cameras to extendable Lazy Boy and home office. Rotarian Keith had it all figured out. He embodied the spirit of a true Rotarian, a man who served the most. He extended this to his family, and dear Lola, his partner in service, became one of us. She was a good and hard-working partner, spearheading the Bosch administration and intake and patiently and quietly supporting Rotarian Keith and the work of the Rotary Club of Grenada East. We had the joy of conferring a Paul Harris Fellow Award, Rotary's highest and most enviable award for service to humanity on partner in service Lola for her work in Bosch and for her warm hospitality she gave at board meetings held at Rotarian Keith. Together with Rotarian Eddie Thomas and Joachim Buff St. John, who both have passed, Rotarian Keith was a rotary stalwart and a testimony to the ideal that it matters not where you start, what matters is where you end. And we have been privileged to share this journey with Keith in many years of fellowship, friendship and service. Our district governor of District 7030, Leslie Ramdani, who we admire and who, like Rotarian Keith, has inspired us in so many ways to be better Rotarians and professionals deeply regrets not being present at this final farewell. He shares this message of condolences to all, but especially the family of Keith. He says, I will always remember him for the very special friendship we shared, for being a role model for Tarian through his passion and total commitment to service to his community, for always being available to participate in our service projects, especially our Bosch eye care clinics. He was a mentor to all Rotarians, and we deeply respected his wisdom, advice, and experience. We have lost a stalwart Rotarian. Rest in internal peace, my friend. And there are so many messages of condolences and tributes from Rotarians near and far, all with a common accord that Rotarian Keith was a visionary, well before his time, 
and an example to all that to survive in a changing world, you must be tolerant and willing to embrace diversity. Jill Scullion from Bosch International, along with Bosch, Michigan, Illinois, and North Carolina, wanted us to share her special words and extends our deepest condolences to the family and friends of Terry and Keith Clark. Keith demonstrated unwavering commitment to providing eye care to Grenadians and went above and beyond to support the doctors and patients before, during, and after these clinics. His presence will be greatly missed and remembered with highest regard. Thank you, Jill Skillian. He has left a rich legacy of service, which we are obliged to honor and emulate. We will miss his anchor, we will miss his smile, his dancing at fellowship, and his youthful charm, which kept us all intrigued. We all hold fond and cherished memories. Goodbye, our brother and friend. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Almighty God has chosen with his infinite wisdom to call our beloved peace to join him in heaven. For he said, let my child come to me, do not stop him, for it is such as him that the kingdom of God belongs. Brother Keith and family attended the St. Gregory's Church in Mount St. Irvins. We will now call on the president, Mr. Desmond Lewis, to do a tribute on behalf of the Mount St. Irvins Church. Good afternoon, everyone. Although it is a tribute from Mount St. Evans Church, I think it will be selfish because Keith Clark was never a selfish person, not to say the St. Andrew the Apostle Church. I think I stand here on behalf of the parish priests and parishioners of the church. Keith Anthony Clark, our brother Clarky, as we usually refer to him, was an ardent worshiper of the St. Andrew the Apostle R.C. Church, Grenville. Although he specifically chose to congregate on a regular basis at St. Gregory's Catholic Church, Monks St. Evans, he served the whole church, that is, the people of God. His life was one of dedicated service to God through the people he encountered. He always played an active role in whatever activity the church undertook. On days of worship, if Keith is not there at least 15 minutes before, you can safely say he is not coming today. If, for whatever reason, he could not worship with us or partake in activity, actively participate in any activity, he will certainly notify in advance. At no point in time did Clark shy away from partaking in any activity, including the liturgy. Even when his feet started to give him problems, he was ably assisted by someone who helped him to climb the stairs to proclaim God's word. Our church committee meeting at Mount St. Evans was fixed for second Tuesday in every month to suit him. Our brother wanted to be certain that nothing came between him, church activity, 
and the Rotary commitment. He wanted to be there to make his contribution to whatever is to be undertaken. He gave of his talent, time, and treasure. He was a man of his words, and either offered a solution or fixed it himself. There was hardly any room for impossibility in his life. For the fundraisers, there were four expressions of support. What is needed? What do I need to do? How much for the ticket? And exactly what time? If he couldn't do it himself, he would always offer an alternative. Mr. Clarkey, as I usually refer to him, was a man of selfless service. He said no to any request. It was always accompanied by a valuable excuse. He never failed to inform his church community of the services the Rotary Club is bringing and how to access them. There was never a dull moment in the life of Mr. Clark. He was always hopeful that his health will improve. His optimism was in the fact that God is in control and he will take care of things. Words of inspiration always flowed from his lips because he firmly believed that with God there is healing. We'll always remember him as a person who taught us that it wasn't about who will do it, but rather what is needed to be done. Be it labor, ice, freezing space, tent, transportation, minor repairs. His response to these were, I will take care of that. When asked, what will be the cost? He responded, that will be taken care of. Indeed, he was a mentor, a worker, a servant of God, a brother. God said, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, Come to me, all who are weary and are overburdened, and I will give them rest. Indeed, he was a mentor, a worker. Again, I said, a servant of God, a brother. May God give him the perfect rest that he deserves in his kingdom. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, Brother Lewis. God looked around his garden and found an empty place. He looked down upon the earth and saw Keith's face. He put his arms around him and lift him to heaven. With the help of his angels, they flew Keith to his resting place in heaven. We now have a tribute in song by Gerald Jeremiah, Brother Keith's nephew.
Your life, a beautiful memory. Your death, a silent grief. You sleep in God's beautiful garden in sunshine of perfect peace. We miss you all so much, but realize God knows best. Brother Keith had lots of friends, and we have Mr. Hugh Dolan, a, form, a friend and colleague, who will now do a tribute. Keith Clark lived on this earth for just over 81 years. In three minutes, I don't even have the time to say good afternoon. As I stand here, the words of William Shakespeare relative to our journey and longevity come to mind. Please stand as we welcome the entrance of the Governor General. Please be seated. So in the words of William Shakespeare, relative to our longevity, like as the waves move or makes towards the pebble shore, so do their minutes hasten to the end. How did Keith spend his 42,573,600 minutes or plus minutes here on earth? I can speak of Keith's very comfortable lifestyle, his home, his vehicle, the fact he always had a dollar in his pocket to spend. But I don't think that is relevant or important as we reflect on his 81 years. I can speak of the wonderful relationship we both had over the years. But then again, not in the church. He was an outstanding Rotarian, so I can speak of Rotary's motto, service above self, to which he was fully committed. But then President Charles Hustle already adequately addressed this. So what can I say about a true friend that is fitting, meaningful, and appropriate at the end of his life's journey? Oh yes, he was my efficient fellow worker who managed the office of Grenada Cablevision here in Grenville from its inception. Hence, I can speak of the wonderful job he did in ensuring the profitability of the company. Again, that is not important at this time. A few minutes are closing in. Uh -huh. I can proudly share with you the number of persons who spoke of how accommodating and understanding he was in ensuring they continued to receive the cable TV service despite the inability to meet their monthly obligations to the company in a timely manner. Keith always found a way to help those in need. He would go to the homes of some of his customers who were ill or physically challenged and unable to make it to the office. So he, the office, went to them. Thoughtful and considerate was he. He also put in place a payment plan to assist those who struggled to meet their monthly commitments to the company. 
Many times I had to remind Keith that Grenada Cable Vision was not an extended arm of the Rotary Club of Grenada East. It was a business. However, lovingly he taught us all a very important lesson, and that is we can earn our success based on service to others and not at the expense of others. I can also share with you the love he had for his entire family and friends. My wife, Alison, and I remember the honor which was bestowed upon us to join himself and his dear wife, Lola, in celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. What a beautiful celebration it was. And then, not too long after the celebration, came the pain and hurt he and I shared as I watched him at the back of this very church, sitting at the side of the casket of his beloved wife, Lola. There he was exhibiting the love, care, and grief of a loyal and devoted husband and family man. Although he continued to show a macho front, it was never the same. That loss affected him deeply. In times like these, when we come together to say goodbye to our loved ones, we think of our own morality and review the life we have lived so far. We might contemplate the many hustles and bustles of life, the fighting, the tugging to get ahead, and the material gains we all strive to acquire as long as life lasts. We might then conclude that if we are not in the interests of positively developing ourselves and others, then our living would have been in vain and not worth mentioning from this sacred altar. It was Albert Einstein who said, only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. We might also observe that people do not remember days and years. They remember shared experiences. It is my hope that the footprints we leave behind, as Keith did, bring joy and hope to those who will replace us and hopefully emulate us. I thank the family for allowing me the honor and the opportunity to talk about my friend. May the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, comfort and encourage each of us at this time of great loss. And may Keith rise in glory on that great resurrection morning. Continue to rest in peace, my brother. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. As mentioned before, Brother Keith was committed to his church and God. He attended church on a regular basis, and when he was unable to do so, he received communion by a Eucharistic minister. We now have Mrs. Margaret Granger, who is a family member and friend, and also Minister of the Eucharist, who will do a tribute. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. Inevitably, what I will say most of it would have been said already. Why? Because we speak of the same person, Keith Anthony. Surname? Surname? Clark. Okay. Why I pause? Because I know he's a Vincent and that's how we are related. His father was my 
grand uncle. So we are second cousins. I didn't know him until about 25 years ago because he didn't live in Grenada. But interestingly, when he came, he tried to make himself familiar with the people whom he didn't know but heard about, and I was one of them. He worked at Cablevision, and I kind of wondered now why I was so often there, I don't remember. But part of it was because we were going to have a family reunion, and he was very instrumental in, in the planning. What can I say about my cousin? I, find him, I found him very generous, but not show off. Humble, giving, caring, and I remembered when Father, our priest, Father Anthony, and I visited him, he asked that I should be the Eucharistic minister coming to him. So I did that. How well known he was, sometimes we think people are not taking note. But the day he was sick, I knew, but I had to go out in that area to give communion to another person. <clears throat> and interestingly, people, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> people who hardly spoke to me said, you know Mr. Mr. Clark sick? You know in hospital? I said, yes, I know, thank you. Um, I have other persons to give communion to. That's how well known he was, okay? It's not a matter of popularity. It's how he has touched people's lives. Simple, giving, caring, kind, generous, and the list goes on. I would like to end here with a poem I composed called Death. In fact, it's in dialect, so I call it Debt. Okay? I remember that I, when my daughter was studying for CXC, I woke up to see what's going on, and when I went downstairs, I got the urge to write that poem. And she said to me, Mommy, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing a poem. Well, Mommy, you know it. I said, somewhere in my head, somewhere. All right? And um, I wrote it. Interestingly, when I went to school, that was a Saturday night, when I went to school on the Monday, a child died that same night. Make the link. God inspires. Okay, so let's go. Death. That is our old teeth, you hear? It's even father and mother, brother and sister, son and daughter, son-in-law and daughter-in-law, brother-in-law and sister-in-law, nenen and parent, cousin and dozen, niece and nephew, uncle and auntie, just anybody. Death could cut style, you hear? Sometimes he come in, now for now. Sometimes he come and he change your mind. You think he gone for good? You forget he and living real happy and perhaps it's if a family, he gone with him. Other times he ain't even acting like a thief. He acting as though he own we, as though he in charge. He come and he lingering, 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 night after night, morning after morning. When you see the suffering he causing your brain, dead, come, come quick and do your business so I could moan and finish. Sometimes he hear you and sometimes he playing death. He lingering even more, he even fooling we. His target get up, walk, talk, eat, strong, strong, strong. And when that target go to sleep, death say enough. Life you cannot keep. I come for you. You will see no new day. And he carry this one away. When loved ones get up, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. He looks so good. He ate his food. This old team death, he fooled me again. Go away. But that's not all. That is a good thief you hear. If he was not there, he would suffer without end. Abusers would do so much wrong. Dictatorship would pend. I tell you plain and strong, I like that good old thief death. He put an end to misery and remind me of Calvary and the victory that is for all are we. So don't fret him. He only mysterious, but he has no power over we. Death, this good old thief, is a gateway to eternity. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Granger. Very original. In tears we saw you sinking. We watched you fade away. Our hearts were broken. You fought so hard to stay. 
But when we saw you sleeping so peacefully, free from pain, we could not wish you back to suffer that again. We will now have a tribute by his sister, Moral Clark. Theme, death. We refer to someone's death as they're going home, they're passing, losing the battle, or they're transforming or transitioning. Transitioning is a process that can be marked by pain, tears, fears, uncertainty, sorrow, or hope, celebration, joy, relief, and happiness. My brother's passing brought back to my memories of my childhood, seeing my mother's tears for the first time. It was the day that Keith embarked on what I now understand as a pilgrim's journey. He was going to a place far away, unknown and uncertain, armed with the hope that he will one day return to help his mother and those of us he left behind. He did succeed. His journey continues, or continued as he returned home to celebration, joy, relief, and to serve his purpose of service to his family and his community. As Christians, we are encouraged to see ourselves as pilgrims and strangers on earth, temporary residents whose true home is heaven. I view my brother's life as the life of a pilgrim transitioning to eternity. Niran Adekunon, a young Nigerian writer, in his writings about the finality of death and lessons men fail to learn explains that the transition of people from the world should always remind us the living of the temporal nature of life, and that in itself should cause us to seek God and the good in others. I don't know if my brother was aware of these writings, but what I do know is that I saw this through his actions. Keith, a brother Keith, as he demanded that we call him, was all, would always be remembered, not only by his love for life, his family traditions, his friends, his good food, his dominoes, his ability to fix every household item and gadget he could find, but most of all, he would be re remembered for his service to the community on his own, and in service with others through the many organizations which he was a part of. His life was not marked by how long he lived, but how well he lived. How well he lived is reflected in the lives he touched positively and the impact of that touch. Keith took his final exit on his transition journey from earth to eternity. He is out of the battle Fighting the good fight is for the living, not for the dead. I am confident that on exiting, he was armed with faith, carrying a certificate of relief from all his earthly duties and wearing the crown of victory, ready to join the saints triumphant. May we, the living, obtain the grace to live well and exit in victory over the sting of death. I thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Clark. We now have the eulogy to be done by Mr. Dominic Jeremiah, brother-in-law of Brother King.
This eulogy was written by his daughter, Sonia. Today we are here to honor the life of a great man, Keith Clark. Keith Anthony Clark was born on the 25th of November, 1941, to his parents, Maria Clark and Wilson Vincent. Keith was the eldest of seven children, followed by Yvonne, Juliana, Merle, Desmond, Dennis, and Jennifer. He was the patriarch of the family, and so no matter the age of his siblings, he always wanted to boss everybody around. Maria was a single parent, so she went to Trinidad to work to support Keith. He lived with his uncle Martin Prince and family in St. Paul's, but they could not afford secondary school education for him. Keith would do homework with his friends who got the opportunity to go to school to make money. He borrowed money to go to the UK, which he repaid as soon as he got his first job. The whole family took a taxi to the port to wave him off. It was a sad day for the family, not knowing when they would see him or hear him again. He was a self-made, very intelligent person from a poor background, so he always encouraged us to complete our education as the key to success. He moved to the UK in 1961, where he met Lola Morris, and they got married in 1966. They had two children, Kenrick and Sonia, seven grandchildren, Kane, Paris, Tasha, Eli, Amel, Rian, and Trey, and one great-grandchild, Emmanuel. In the early years, Dad would play cricket at the Oval in London, and a trip to Notting Hill Carnival was an annual family event as this was probably the closest link to home that he had. Dad loved everything, entertaining. Every Sunday was like a party in the Clark's household. Friends and family would come over to play records, eat, drink, and play dominoes. He loved to dance, and we would laugh when his favorite calypso was playing. He would be dancing with his arms open wide. The house was always filled with laughter and happiness. Many of you won't be aware that dad loved dogs. I remember the first time he brought a dog home without warning, and locked, I locked myself in my bedroom for hours because I was so scared. Once in Grenada, there were always dogs around the house. Dad had various jobs, roles in the UK, ranging from bus driver to HDV driver before settling with Royal Mail between 1982 and 1993 working his way up the ranks to management level. Dad always dreamed of returning home to his country, Grenada, which he finally achieved in 1994. When I got married in 1993, Dad felt that he didn't have to worry about me anymore, so he felt free to leave England. He was at the center of his community here in Grenada. He spent years as a Rotarian, and was very proud of the fact that he was president for many years, a justice of the peace, advisor to the credit union, a reader in church, and security for the pharmacy. In addition to all this, dad was a handyman and would lend a hand to anything around the house, particularly an electrical, on the electrical side. Dad would climb a ladder, sometimes I would always tell him off about it, to place wall-mounted fans, sensor lights, or anything else that would come to mind. He always made sure no one was around when he decided to do these jobs, so no one could stop him. Dad was also well-versed in technology. He had, so, he had social media accounts for Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, which I didn't have, and always had the, the top of the range gadget better than mine. His partner in technology, Mr. Winston Cookshan, would visit him every couple of weeks to set up and discuss the latest gadget. They even shared the same birthday. Dad introduced me to Skype. He could see straight, straight away when anyone logged in onto their computers, and he would uh, be straight on the phone saying, I could see you online. <laughs> when Skype was replaced by WhatsApp, we would have video calls every couple of days. Sometimes I would be in the office whispering, Dad, is everything okay? I'll call you later, as the video call came through. Dad loved his grandchildren. 
his great-grandson, Emmanuel, and would video call regularly to see, to see Manny as he is taught. Our only regret is that we couldn't see Manny in person, as that was our plan for next year. It seems that that, it seemed that Dad knew everything in Grenada. He gained the nickname of Mayor of Grenville, as he couldn't go around without calling out to everyone he met on the street. Even now, when I mention his name in and around any office in Grenville, everyone knew him. Dad worked as the general manager of both gravel and concrete and the Grenville Cablevision office before retiring. Even when retirement, he liked to keep his mind active, helping others, caring, and giving back to the community. He would identify the elderly members to receive a Christmas hamper, and he and mom were active with the annual eye care clinic organized by Rotary. He was a very organized person. He could plan major projects, even down to his own funeral. He gave me the program for this funeral well in advance, and would say, Sonia, this is just in case. Later in life, the simple thing made that happen. He, would, he was an avid cricket lover and would watch cricket all day on television. If the match was particularly exciting, he would call Alex, his son-in-law, and say, did you see the match? Then they would discuss it. If Shai or Gail passed by, he would discuss it with them. He would follow the cricket matches of his young nephews, Johan and Gerald, in the up and coming cricket career. On a Saturday afternoon, Dad would look forward to driving down to washing shop to play dominoes and to beat the younger guys to prove that his mind was still sharp. Dad was particularly, um, was very particular about food. Mom would prepare it in certain ways. When mom passed, Michelle made a special effort to maintain the status quo. That had an impact on so many in his life. Many behind the scenes as I am now uh, discovering. Although we are all grieving the loss of a large, larger than life individual, I believe that he is now at peace, pain free, and back with his beloved wife, Lola. He may be gone, but, we ne but never forgotten. A visit to Grenada will never be the same again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeremiah. And this comes to the end of our tribute. We now ask the family members to please proceed to the back of the church for the final viewing and reception of the body.
In the name of the Father, and the of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. I bless the body of my brother, Kids now in the holy water that recovers his badges. On this most right, on the most way of Christ, Christ Jesus, we baptize into his death. My baptism into his death be a very strong reality. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the year of the Father, we too might be in the life. For if we have an eternity by the likeness of his death, so shall we be in the eternity by the likeness of his resurrection. Let us pray. Lord God, your name has seen us. Accept the soul of your servants. Kids, now. Forgive the sins he has committed during my throat in your death. Free him from the bonds of death and lead him into the last life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The angels.
a reading. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. On this mountain, he will remove the mourning veil over all peoples and the shroud enwrapping all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord will wipe away the tears from every cheek. He will take away his people's shame everywhere on earth. For the Lord has said so. That day it will be said, See, this is our God in whom we hope for salvation. The Lord is the one in whom we hoped. We exult and we rejoice that he has saved us. The word of the Lord. From the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Hope is not deceptive because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit which has been given us. We were still helpless when at his appointed moment Christ died for sinful men. It is not easy to die even for a good man, though of course for someone really worthy a man might be prepared to die. But what proves that God loves us is that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Having died to make us righteous, 
Is it likely that he would now fail to save us from God's anger? When we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, we were still enemies. Now that we have been reconciled, surely we may count on being saved by the life of his son. Not merely because we have been reconciled, but because we are filled with joyful trust in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have already gained our reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Then the Jews started arguing with one another, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They said, Jesus replied, I tell you most solemnly, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. As I, who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. This is the bread come down from heaven, not like the bread our ancestors ate. They are dead. But anyone who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Lord. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand, I am tired. Let 
as I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall, precious Lord, precious Lord. Moments like this comes with mixed feelings, mixed reactions, and a lot of questioning that comes in our minds. We begin to wonder, God, where are you? God, why now? Why him? Why us? Why this family? We are trying to heal from the loss of the wife trying to heal from the challenges of health. And the next thing we could hear, a life of no more. And now what does this tell those of us who are still alive? It tells us one truth and one reality that cannot be changed by anybody. And that reality is that death is real. It comes when it comes. Is no respecter of anybody. And we all must die. Our wealth, beauty, handsomeness, positions, power, property, everything one day comes to naught. And now there is something that we need to be aware of. It is not just all about being scared of death. What is more important is preparing for death. And now this preparation for death is exactly what our brother, our father, God's own child, did. He prepared himself. He was conscious of the fact that although he was in pain, but he was conscious of God. And I think we've all gathered here to celebrate life, to celebrate a committed fellow who was conscious of God, who was conscious of environment, conscious of the people around him, and who made every effort amidst the human struggles, amidst the human frailty. He was conscious of the principles of God that surrounds him, and he made every effort, even when he cannot be in church. He was in God, he was in church, because he got the privilege and opportunity to receive the sacraments. I'm not here to begin to make another eulogy, but I'm here to remind us that the best preaching that we get or the best eulogy we get is the eulogy of the number of lives that we have touched, the number of people we have influenced positively. And that is why it is important when you look at the readings of today, especially looking at the first reading taken from the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah was addressing a congregation that have lost hope. Isaiah was addressing a congregation that was bitter about the challenges of the time, the losses of the time, the pains of the time, and all the inconveniences that they have experienced because of their faithfulness to God. And that is why when I started with those questions, those fundamental questions, why? It's a philosophical question that has no answer to this point. The how question, which is a sociological question, is all about when did this happen, how did this happen, and all the descriptive analysis we can make, but the reality remains that our brother is no more. But now there is hope, and that is why the first reading began by making provisions of this hope, and that provision was in those words that on this mountain, and what is the picture of this mountain? The mountain we are dealing with at this hour, both as family, as children, and as congregation, and as friends, and as church, and as society, is the mountain of the death of our loved one. It's a heavy mountain for all of us. But on this mountain, the scripture began by saying, on this mountain, the Lord of all glory, the Lord of all hosts, will wipe away our tears, which means... Yes, we are permitted to cry. 
But there is only one person that can wipe away our tears. That is why the number of consolation we are going to get, the number of please take heart, please sorry, they are not going to change anything. The only thing that is going to be consoling for us is that God is speaking. My son, my daughter, this family of Clark, you need to understand something. God is still with you. And I want us to be consoled also for friends and well-wishers that have also come to identify on this day. We are all gathered here because in one way or another, our brother has influenced us. He has touched our life. At least for the time being that I got to get closer and understand him very well. From the very moment when I walked here and I met in Mount St. Evans, I could see his commitment to church. I could see the connection on how he wants the community to grow. Members of the Rotary Club who also knows from the many times that he was also responsible in one of the functions, either as president or somebody involved in one of the committees or not. But he discovered in some of the instances on where they had to make commitment in ensuring that lives of people are better, both in our schools, in the community. So you could see that his commitment is not just in church, but his, com his commitment is about humanity. In my conversations with him from time to time, he's always thinking about what to do, how to contribute, and how to touch lives. And I find, my friends in Christ, this is what it takes. For us to be Christians, we first of all must have to become human beings. It is only when we are human that we can understand the principles of Christianity and know that Christianity is all about relationship, and this relationship is coming directly from God. But that notwithstanding, like we rightly pointed out, death is a reality. And now when it comes, it comes with a lot of heaviness. It comes with a lot of pain. It comes with a lot of pressure, especially for those who are the bereaved ones. Here we are as a source of encouragement to the family members, to the children. Here we are as a way of paying our last respect. Here we are to look at the lives and the times of our brother. Here we are to look at the fundamental examples that he left for us. But above all, we are here to pray as a church and as a community to talk to God should there, in case of any human frailty, he's to be denied heaven. This is the reason why we are here, to pray to God. That as God, as he goes back to meet his judgment, and as he goes back to join the heavenly throne, that God will look upon him with mercy and love and admit him into the heavenly throne. But we are consoled, especially in the last few days. I remember going by the hospital to give him communion, and he was so strengthened. I said, Father, I know nothing will happen to me. But if anything happens, I'm aware of where I'm going to. And that for me was enough consolation. And when it came finally, just a day after that very day, that he was no more, that he has passed, I remember those words. Although it was painful, I remember those words as words of consolation that he was privileged. And I know that even before I went, Father Tony was also there. And this is somebody who does not hesitate to look for the priest, to look for the church community, and ask for prayers. But that now we stand in friends in Christ. I want us to understand that Jesus is right here with us. He understands our field. He knows what we are dealing with at this hour. And that is why those words of the prophecy of Isaiah in chapters number 25, I want to take those prophetic words as words that are being addressed to all of us as a family, as children, and as friends that have gathered here. He said the Lord God will destroy death, which means... The only thing that can destroy death is the presence of God and through the power of the resurrection. The question there is any Christian would like to ask, why did Jesus die? Jesus died to prove to us that the human aspect of us, in order for us to grow, in order for the soul to come back to God, we must go through the process of purification. The process of purification means that just like any plant or any seed is planted, for that seed to grow, that seed must first of all go through the process of rot. It is after that process that it begins to grow and begins to germinate. 
our brother physically is no more. But spiritually, the soul is going back to the Father. And this soul that is going back to the Father, you could understand even in the scripture when Jesus encountered the story of his best friend Lazarus to have died. He said Jesus went to the family. And why Jesus was in the, with the family, the shortest verse of the Bible, John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Why would Jesus weep? Jesus wept because he feels our feel. Jesus wept because he knows the importance of a loved one. And for those of us who are in deep pain, Jesus is also weeping with us. He understands with us. But while we weep, Jesus is also acknowledging and letting us know that we must listen to the words of St. Paul. St. Paul reminded us that although we are free to cry, we are free to bawl, we are free to experience our encounter of what we are dealing with at this hour. But Paul is telling us, let us cry, let us feel like those who believe in the power of the resurrection. Let us believe like those who have that conviction that Jesus died and on the third day he resurrected. We may be going through our own Good Friday now, but we should be consoled of the Easter joy that our Father is experiencing as he departs from this world. That notwithstanding, the prophecy or the words of St. Paul to the church in Rome from where we got our second reading was a message of hope. This message of hope is the fact that Paul is addressing the congregation that hope is not deceptive. This hope that is not deceptive, we must understand that our hope in God, our hope in Jesus cannot fail us. And that is why we believe in the power of the resurrection. In the book of Lamentations, precisely in chapters number 3, from verse 22 to 23, the Bible says, The steadfastness of the Lord never ceases. They are new every morning. They are new every evening. Great is thy faithfulness. As we look up to the Creator, my dear sisters and my dear brothers, it is important for us to begin to look into our hearts, begin to look into our lives and ask ourselves some fundamental questions. If death comes now, where will I be? I think the fear that majority of us have about death is the fact that we are not sure of our destination. Because it's not about church, it's not about how ceremonial and religiously we live our lives. What is important is that the life that we have here, just like St. Paul will always teach, the life and death of each and every one of us has an influence on one another. And that is why it is important that we have to checkmate ourselves. What kind of lives are we living? Are we living a life of godliness? Are we living a life of conviction? Are we living a life of touching other lives? Like I will always tell my congregation, each time we come for funeral, it is important to acknowledge one fact. Funeral is not about those who have passed. They have finished their journey here on earth. They are moving to a new life. Funerals are more or less for those of us who are still alive. The purpose of funeral is for us to call us to order. It's for us to be humbled. It's for us to know that today is the turn of our brother. Tomorrow it can be me. Tomorrow it could be you. Tomorrow it could be anybody. How prepared are we? If we are to be told now how many of us would like to go to heaven, I'm sure the whole church will say, yes, we are liking, we want to go to heaven. But if we are asked how many of us would like to die now, I wonder some may pick stone to throw the priest. Because, Father, you don't dare say that. But I want to let you know that the only license, the only certificate, the only passport to heaven is that we must die. But now it's not about the regulation of the timing. It is not about, that's why when Paul had to teach, he said, or the letter of the, the, the writings of the book of wisdom reminded us, especially in the third chapter. He said, the life of the virtuous is in the hands of God. And now when you look at chapters number 7 of that same scriptural text, it goes for that to remind us of one fact. It said, length of days doth not count. The number of times we have lived is not what makes life measurable. 
but how we are able to impact in the lives of people. And now St. Paul also went for that to remind us of one consciousness, and Paul, right into the church, went for that to describe this fact. He said we must have to understand that what is reality is not all about what we are going to lose, what we are going to get, what, how we are supposed to be afraid of death. But we don't need to be afraid of death. We need to live our life in consciousness of the presence of God, convinced that God who created us cannot save us without us. Friends in Christ, we are here on a special day as we say farewell to our brother. We begin to look at all the wonderful things he has done. We are not concentrating on maybe the thoughts. We are concentrating on the commitment, the sacrifices, the efforts he has made not just in the church, in the community, in the society, in the government, and every other place that he saw himself exist. And I think that we all, we have a responsibility. We have a contribution of what is expected of us, what is required of us. And that is the more reason why our gathering here is to draw that attention, to look at the things we are not doing rightly and begin to correct them immediately. To look at the areas of our life that requires attention and begin to do something about it. It is on this note, my dear sisters and brothers, I will want to utilize this moment to commend those who we are there for our brother, those who participated actively to be with him and for him and around the time that he needed us. And I say this because it is very important that many a time we celebrate people more when they are no more. The best time to celebrate people is to celebrate them when they are still alive, when they can notice your help and be able to say thank you to you, like we already know. Flowers does not make sense after the death of the person. Give flowers when people can see you and appreciate you and know who's giving flower and not to bring trees and palm trees to give to us when the person is no more. It is on the strength, friends in Christ, as we appreciate and thank and commend all those who are there, both from the head perspective, family perspective, church perspective, friends perspective. It is also important to remind those of us who may not be conscious of that little help, that little things matter a lot. And I'd have this one to say. I say this because of this very fact. We live in a time when care is very expensive. People prefer to just do things the way they want it because they don't want inconvenience. Care is very important. From the health sector to the family sector to the church sector, it is important for us to understand the care we give to people can keep them more than when we believe on just taking medication and just doing things out of routine. You know why I say that? Because most people who have died today, whether in the hospital or in the family or elsewhere, they did not die because they did not get the right diagnosis. They did not die because they did not get the right medication. Because you can get the right medication, you can get the right diagnosis, but if you don't have the right care, nothing will work. So it is important we need to understand that we need to look out for one another. We need to do something because it is not just enough to say we are Christians. And I have a challenge with that. Because sometimes some of us, we hide under the umbrella of Christianity. And yet, we go to church and church does not go through us. We speak about Jesus, but Jesus does not know us. We talk about God, but we are far away from God. The best way we can leave God and leave church and leave Christianity is to practicalize our Christianity by living a life that is just and right. And that is why it is also important, because if you realize of late... We have started telling lies inside the church. Because most times, some of the eulogies we read in church, they are fake. Tanti nice, uncle good, but we know the man bad. <laughs> Truth be told. But one of the things I want us to be encouraged, like I will always say, please, brothers and sisters, live your life in such a way that when we finally die, the priest does not need to crack the brain to think of what to preach. We don't need to give pressure to the priest to preach because we already know what we need to know. This man is a good man. 
And that's enough preaching. We don't need to come and say, well, I don't know much, you know, but this man, I used to see him somewhere, but today he's in church. There is something we have to understand. Our lives should speak for us. The best eulogy are not those ones we read in church. The best eulogy is the eulogy you hear people speak from the land, in the bathroom, while driving, while in the dining. Oh, that man dead? Oh, what a good man. What a good woman. That is the eulogy we're talking about. Not the one the man died. Oh, thank God he dead. People celebrating that somebody passed. We are talking about where your life touches people because people feel the impact of your contribution to society. People feel the impact of your contribution to humanity. That is exactly what we are celebrating. And I think it has come to a point where the consciousness of being human is important because we need to be human because before we can even be in church or be in any part of position of society. We are having problems in society today because we are lacking human beings to occupy positions. And it is important we have to have human beings with human hearts to be able to touch the lives of human beings. Friends in Christ, while we make these reminders to ourselves, it is important to know today that our brother has lived his own. Like Macbeth will say in his literature, Life is like a stage, and we have come on a very stage. After every scene, the curtain is closed. What are we doing with our lives today? What will I be remembered for? What will you be remembered for? And what shall we all be remembered for? It is not late yet. We can do something. We can begin now. St. Paul will always tell us, Hic et nunc, here and now, we can start something. And to begin something means that we don't need to wait until we are dead. We don't need to wait until something happens before we say, oh, I find I need to start doing something today. But I think there is something that I've come to realize also about us. Sometimes when something happens, we realize we are in cold. Somebody just passed. Everybody is so calm. We wait for third night. We wait for all that. People are very calm. Everybody is so conscious, meditating what just happened. But I've realized something. That as soon as we go to the cemetery and the person touch the ground and everybody go, we forget. And as soon as we forget, people are already moving with happy hour. One for the road, two for the street, and three for the highway. And we forget. Until something happens again, we come back. It is a reality. Friends, as we pray for the repose of our brother, we want to also use this opportunity to beckon on us. Look around you, especially in this season of Lent, in the neighborhood, in the street, in the community, in the church. There are people that need our help. There are people that need our attention. There are people that need to be looked at for. Let us do the necessary. Let us do the needful. Let us begin to touch lives. That is the mission of the man lying here. He is always thinking of other people, even in his own critical situation. Sometimes I will tell him, look after yourself. I say, Father, no, can you come down now? I think there is something. There are people who need help. We need to think of a way to get to them. This is the kind of the mindset of a Christian person with a human soul that we are talking about. And that is exactly what is touching me at this moment. It is important as we pray, and we say, thank God for his life. We don't know when death will come. I think it was in this church I made one story. I reminded us of a story that we don't know when death will come. It will come anywhere. And I reminded us of that story where each time somebody dies, a man comes in and announces the person who is to die next. As soon as they are burying, somebody will come and say, wait. And people listening for their names. I said, the person to die next, he will mention and on this very day he came, he did not announce any name. And everybody was surprised and shocked. And they went by the cemetery. And while they were in the cemetery, he did not announce any name. And people said, well, today, thank God, maybe a holiday. There's no name to be announced. Why they were thinking about that? And I said, well, today is different. 
the first person or the last person to leave the cemetery is the person to die. As we speak, everybody is still in the cemetery. <laughs> nobody wants to go because nobody wants to die. What is the connection of this? It means that we cannot run away from death. It will come. The only thing we have to do about death now is to prepare. Live a rightful life. Keep your hands clean. If they are dirty, go and wash them. Try to do the right thing and be God's own child. Remember, we came with nothing and we shall go with what? Nothing. Did you think of that? As a child, when he came, his hands were closed. He was crying, naked. We had to get clothes to cover and to do other things. Nothing. We came into life, we struggled, we got into positions, and everything worked fine. But what happened? Deaths came. The same thing we did when he was small is what we have done now. We put on clothes again because you can't wear your clothes anymore. The nice pants, the nice shoes, you can't put them yourself. You need help. Somebody had to put them. And at the end, all these things, both the casket, they will remain in this cemetery. The only thing going back to God is the soul. So of what need is the fighting? Of what need is the pressure, the land boundaries, the struggles, court cases, problems here and there, fighting down people? Of what need is that? Let us learn to be humble and allow God to continue to bless us. We pray for the many of us who have gathered here. I pray that we be consoled. I pray that we be energized. And for the family members, and especially the children, let us learn from the example of our father. Our father here is a gentleman. Our father here is a churchman. Our father here is a Christian. He may have his excesses, but we know he's a man of principle. Learn from his example. If our examples is not connecting to his example, review. Hear this message, and that the legacy he has left for us guide us and lead us only to the truth. May his soul and the soul of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes for his church, confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus. We join our prayers to his. In your response, hear our prayer. In baptism, Keith received the light of Christ, scattered darkness now and lead him over the waters of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our Our brother Keith was nourished at the table of, us, of the Savior. Welcome him into the hall of the heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our our, our brother Keith spent his life following Jesus, poor, chaste, and obedient. Count him among all holy men and women who sing in your courts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Our brother Keith shared in the pursuit of Jesus Christ. Lead us. 
Many people died by violence, war, and farming each day. Show us your mercy to those who suffer so unjustly these sins against your love, and gather them to eternal kingdom of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Those who trusted in the Lord now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. Lord, in your mercy. The family and friends of Keith seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubts that come from grief. Lord, in your mercy. We assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our brother Keith. Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectations of your son's coming. Lord, in your mercy. We now turn to Mary, our mother, asking her to intercede to her son, Jesus, for a brother. And for each one of us here this afternoon, as we see, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls. Hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the voices of your people whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in the kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
always with the front seat and say the Lord is blessed. As we are with the blessed Lord, we have to come and say,
thank, thank you, Dad, for all that you have done for us and what you mean to us. You'll always be in our hearts. Your legacy will forever live on. May you rest in peace. Thank you very much. Just to let you know that refreshments will be served, uh, light refreshments will be served afterwards by the house. Thank you very much.
in the sight of this world, he is now dead. In your sight, may he live forever. Forgive whatever sins he committed through human weakness, and in your goodness, grant him everlasting peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Dry the tears of those who weep. We pray to the Lord. Lord you wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend, comfort us in our sorrow. We pray to the Lord. You raised the dead to life. Give to our brother Keith eternal life. We pray to the Lord. Lord and you promise paradise to the repentant thief. Bring Keith to the joys of heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord yeah. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. We pray to the Lord. Lord yeah. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table of your heavenly kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord yeah. They're not showing the emotions, but deep in the heart, they are moved by emotion. They are feeling the pain, the loss of a father, a grandfather, an uncle. So we pray, Lord, and ask you to comfort them in their sorrow, each member, at the death of Keith. Let the faith be our consolation and eternal life, our hope. We pray to the Lord. God of holiness and power, accept our prayers on behalf of your servant Keith. Do not count his deeds against him, for in his heart he desired to do your will. As his faith united him to your people on earth, so may your mercy join him to the angels in heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time we lower the coffin and we sing a hymn. Oh, great thou art. Oh, great thou art. And I don't want to go
Okay. Him, Dominic. Precious Lord. You go, you go. Go around. You go. Let me get out here from your way.
Prince of the Humble, hear your people who cry to you in their need and strengthen the hope in your lasting goodness. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Together we say, eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May his soul rest in peace. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may Almighty God bless each and every one. Bless you. Bless them, Father, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll continue to sing. Okay, then I could say now go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Okay. okay. <laughs> Dickie, can you take this back for me?